Uh, thank you very much for inviting me, um, to the people that invited me today. I'm really um, grateful to be here. It's a really exciting conference where we're tackling some really important issues. Um, what I was going to talk to you about today is a little bit about the work that I've done working with male victims of domestic violence. So I'm really trying to just give you a bit of a summary of, or a whistle-stop tour really, I suppose, through some of the work that I've done so far um, since I did my PhD. So it's going to be touching a little bit on four different studies really. Um, one which was looking at their experiences of physical and um, psychological and emotional abuse. Another one that is looking at post-separation abuse and touching on issues around um, fatherhood. So obviously we've talked a bit about that today already. Um, looking a little bit at the barriers to help seeking and then also trying to look a little bit at experiences of recovery and things that happen after. So I'm sure that you'll be aware of some of the cases that have been in the media more recently. Um, for anybody that hasn't seen Alex Skeel's documentary on BBC Three, I would definitely recommend you watch it. It's an incredibly powerful story of his experiences. I think that in the time that I've been doing this research, I'd say about 11 years or so now, um, we are talking more about it than we did do when I first started, and that gives me hope, even though there is still quite a lot to do and to achieve in this area. Um, I was a bit late this morning, so I can only apologise if what I'm going to be talking about overlaps with what Nikki talked about this morning. Nikki was my PhD supervisor, so we have a lot of the same um, opinions on all of these models and things like that. So if I get a bit ranty, like, and she did as well, I, I can only apologise. Um, so, in terms of actually the theory and the literature in an academic sense, but also in terms of how that influences practice in this area... Within the domestic violence practice and research, we are looking at a gendered um, model. Now, that has come from the 1970s onwards, this feminist movement had really pushed forward us exploring issues about violence against women. Um, and it was a massively important area of research that did really raise the profile of actually talking about domestic violence. So sort of pre-1970s, we just didn't talk about stuff that happened in the home. So actually, what they did has caused a huge amount of success, I suppose, in terms of raising domestic violence into the public narrative. As a consequence of that, though, because it was really grounded in this sort of feminist um, ideology, what it's done is it's created a really dominant narrative, that is, that gender is the most important factor when we look at domestic violence. So when we talk about the causes of IPV, um, domestic violence, sorry, within this framework, you are talking about the cause of it being gender. Men hitting women, being aggressive and violent and abusive towards women because they are men, because there are patriarchal values that are driving their <coughs> behaviour, because as a patriarchal society we tolerate this sort of thing, we tolerate violence against women. So as a model, that's become incredibly powerful. It became very powerful, it's still very powerful in the research and in practice. But alongside that, around the same time, there was another body of work that was growing, didn't receive as much attention for a, a variety of reasons, I'm sure you can understand. Um, and that is that we started to talk about, well, actually, what about men in this situation? So Susan Steinmetz wrote a paper called The Battered Husband Syndrome, and she wrote and published that in 1978. And in that paper, she was saying, well, actually, there are issues, there are instances of domestic violence towards men, but that actually the stigma that is associated with it um, stops men coming forward, it stops them reporting. So her work also talked about um, some of the post-Renaissance customs that were associated with um, how we tackle domestic violence. So in the post-Renaissance times um, across the world, there were these practices called the Charivari. And Charivari was about punishing people that went against the social norms and the dominant social norms that existed within society. So for men, what that meant at the time is that they were punished if they were victims of domestic violence because they had allowed their woman to beat them, to challenge that power within the home. So Susan Steinmetz really used some of this as, as well as other instances that she had found where actually throughout history we see instances of men's experiences of domestic violence but we just don't talk about it the same way. Another thing that had happened around the same time was Murray Strauss had developed the conflict tactics scale. So the conflict tactics scale was a gender neutral measure that was used to ask about conflict in relationships. It wasn't asking about domestic violence, it was saying in relationships sometimes conflicts happen, sometimes this gets out of control. Of these things, of this list of behaviours, how many of these things have you done, how many has your partner done? And what you actually find is when you use this sort of data, men and women were talking about being violent in relationships at roughly similar rates. 
that actually conflict within relationships was more common than I think most people had realised. And that actually, yeah, men and women and people in same-sex relationships were using violence in their intimate relationships. One of the issues that developed from that, because actually from, if you could trace the sort of story from the 1970s, it's basically been a lot of conflict in itself where you have these two different bodies of work. You have the feminist perspective that is really strongly working to protect women, but is actually focused so much on gender that they ignore and tend to really marginalise men's experiences. The family violence perspective, which Mary Strauss and of these other researchers fit within, it was really very much about actually trying to understand intimate, um, blah, blah, sorry, violence in intimate relationships and how that's part of family violence and how that fits within a broader pattern of the violence that you see in the home. So parents, children, siblings, all of that. The issue that you have is that this sort of academic fighting, which is the most passive-aggressive sort of fighting you can find, um, going backwards and forwards was always that actually any of the work that was done that really challenged this sort of dominant narrative was criticised. And feminist researchers and people who were really grounded in that gender ideology, like Michael Johnson, if anybody's ever heard me talk before, I always include this quote, and I know I always include this quote, but to me it really captures actually that it's sort of saying... Yes, all right, there is domestic violence towards men, but actually it's, it's not taken seriously. It can't be that impactful. It doesn't impact on men the same. So he says, when a woman slaps her husband in the heat of an argument, it's unlikely to be interpreted by him as a serious attempt to do him physical harm, and in fact is likely to be seen as a quaint form of feminine communication. So I'm just going to let you ponder that for a moment. The reality is, though, that actually that captures really what people think about men's experiences sometimes within that literature, that actually, well, OK, so women can be violent, but it's probably always in self-defence because the man would have started it, or even if it isn't, then she's a woman and he's a big guy and it can't do that much you know, damage, can't impact on men in the same way that it can women. And one of the things that I think is really, um, contra well, I say controversial, but one of the things that's really debated as well is this idea of control and coercive control. So this thought that actually, okay, so if women can be aggressive, perhaps it's as a loss of control that actually they are just reacting either to um, their, own, their partner's perpetration of violence or perhaps they're just losing control and being very expressive with their violence. The idea of coercive control is a really foundation of that feminist model. The control that is talked about in that model has its roots in patriarchy. It's patriarchal control that we're talking about. So actually, women using control is then again something that goes against that model. But we do see that women use control. We see women's use of control and behaviour, again, equal in men's, if so, not in some cases showing as being higher than men's use of control and behaviour. What we then see is that when you look at it in more detail, that actually there are circumstances that create situations where women can be even more controlling. And so one of those is this um, idea of something called legal and administrative aggression. So Tilbrook, who was an Australian researcher, was looking at men's experiences and had really noticed that actually for several times within the narratives of these men, they were talking about systems being used against them or their ex-abusive partner using a system to make it so that their abuse continued. So actually, what you see is that this is higher. You see this higher in women's perpetration because as a system, obviously, we're very geared towards, because of all of that history, supporting women as victims and men as perpetrators. So this, as an issue in terms of experience, is definitely there, but it's also a massive issue in terms of preventing men leaving violent relationships. Men don't often leave violent relationships. Number one, from Denise Hines and her work in America, the number one factor for not leaving is their children. Either the fear of what will happen to their children if they're not there, or the fear of them losing relation, that relationship or that contact with their children. And actually, again, within some of Denise Hines' work, um, she commented and reported that actually over half of the men within her sample had talked about their partner manipulating the system. So we do really see evidence of women's control within both the intimate relationship but also using these systems around to really emphasise that. And I think one thing to kind of just mention here is this idea of um, it always being about self-defence and retaliation. Actually, a lot of the time, men don't retaliate. When women are abusive to them, a lot of the time they don't retaliate. 
Now, there is a lot of bidirectional bi violence that you see within the literature, but also within um, police reports and things as well. But, so that it is the case, that obviously, sometimes it is bidirectional, but sometimes women are hitting men and men aren't hitting back. And a lot of that's been talked about as this idea of chivalry. So actually, the condemnation of violence against women by men or women is a really strong narrative now within society. But actually, there's no condemnation of violence against men. There's no condemnation of women's violence. Women's violence is still painfully used as a tool of humour in a lot of comedy programmes and things on TV. So actually, this is a whole other kind of issue that um, plays a part within um, how we understand men's violence and men's experiences of their victimisation as well. So... Um, some of the work that I've done then was wanting to explore in a bit more detail their victimisation. So I've worked with male victims of domestic violence. In response to some of the criticisms of the work that I've done previously using scales like the conflict tactic scale where I've demonstrated that women can be violent, what you see within that is that there's a criticism that, oh, well, you're not capturing really true anything. You know, you're not capturing the context of it. It's the picture's not really there. Men's experiences are just not as bad. I know from the work that I've done with mankind and I know from people that I've spoken to that that isn't the case. So what I wanted to do with this body of work was to really evidence that in a scientific and sort of empirically driven way. So I used a qualitative online questionnaire that was completely anonymous. So I purposely chose to do that and when Mark Brooks, um, who talk, will be talking tomorrow, I'll talk about the work at Mankind, he'll talk, I'm sure, about the, the fact that anonymity is really important to men sometimes when they're asking for help or trying to talk about their experiences. And actually, within this data, a quarter of the men that had reported on their experiences had never told anybody else. So I purposely wanted something where men could talk about what they'd experienced to give as much detail and context as they wanted to, but to know that they were doing it in a safe way because they would never be identified. And so what I saw within the, liter uh, within the data, sorry, were these experiences of verbal and physical aggression, the controlling behaviour, and some sexual aggression as well. And so I'm just going to show you a few slides that have got some quotes on. So the verbal and physical aggression, again, in contradiction to this idea that women's violence isn't that serious or it's not impacting on men, the violence that was in this um, data was quite significant. Men were talking about serious physical violence. They were talking about injuries that had occurred as a consequence of this violence. And some of the other things that you would, I saw within the um, data was a little bit around, actually, almost this idea that women tried to conquer that kind of physical imbalance in a different way. So men would talk about being hit or being um, abused while they were asleep or while they were in the shower. So when they were at their most vulnerable. And this was something that I saw consistently throughout this data set and it was a really defining feature of it. So there was this serious physical um, and verbal aggression. And when I ask, because again, I think it's important for me to know when I'm talking about it, whether I have captured any bidirectional abuse. So I asked the question, did you ever hit back or were you ever abusive back? Um, and over two-thirds of the sample said they had never, ever hit back in any way. And then when I unpicked that a little bit and asked why, again, there were a variety of different reasons. Some of it was that chivalrous protective attitude. Well, I was brought up never to hit a woman. So as boys, we bring boys up not to hit girls, but we don't bring girls up not to hit boys or other girls. So actually, a lot of these men had talked about the fact, well, I was raised never to hit a woman. And this normative protection then that we create in men where they're wanting to protect and look after women. For some, it was because they were frightened. So they were frightened either of what would happen if, for example, as this last quote shows here, what would happen if they tried to defend themselves, even just sort of trying to hold her off. If he left any physical mark on her, he knew that she would then use that to make a false allegation to the police or to services or to threaten to. But also they were scared because actually if they tried to do anything to defend themselves or retaliate, it was possible that the reaction that would come back would be even worse. So there was a lot of fear there as well. And there was sexual violence as well within this. Sex used as a form of violence in terms of this sort of very physical aspect of it, but also sex as a form of um, abuse and control. So sex used in terms of manipulation around pregnancy and things, that was really apparent. But also men talked about being forced to have sex when they didn't want to. Now, as you'll probably be aware, the rape laws that exist within the UK at the moment don't allow for a woman to rape a man. 
So it really challenged what they understood about all of this sort of notion of rape and sexual violence because they'd been forced to do something that they didn't want to do. Siobhan Weir, who works at Lancaster University, has done a, a huge amount of work around this. Um, so, Because I'm not going to talk too much more about this bit, but if you were interested in this bit, do look at her work. It's amazing. I then also looked at and asked about the controlling behaviour. So men within this sample talked about the fact that they had become isolated. So they'd had their relationships manipulated in a way that then meant that they no longer had real strong relationships with their friends and family. So for the first one here, he, she'd insisted that if you, lo you love me, you wouldn't want to spend time with anybody else. And so slowly but surely, those relationships around him, his social network and support were disappearing. Again, this idea that actually if you did go and spend time with them, what would you be walking back into when you come home? So that fear and that dread that was associated with it. But also in some really sort of sneaking, indirect ways, those relationships were being manipulated. So I know that there's one, um, it's not this one here, but there's, um, on this one, um, she was deleting messages and things. On another one, she changed the phone numbers in his phone so that um, only slightly by like one digit. So it looked the same, but then actually, obviously, when he was trying to send messages to people, they weren't going through. So there was a lot of this control that really did leave these men isolated. And then that was then continued with the threats and manipulation. So again, this exertion of control over these men. So for some men, it was around their children. So that top quote where she's basically threatened to kill them if he ever left or if he didn't do exactly what she wanted. There's the other one is around, the second one there is about um, this man had experienced child abuse as a child and he had confided in her and only her about this. And she would told people about it and used it again as a way to abuse and control him. Um, and then the threat of removing or affecting or destroying the relationship with the child. That was, again, a really strong theme for any of the fathers in the sample. Any sort of fear that they had was mostly revolved around their children and losing their children. And I also about, asked about something called gaslighting. Um, so for anybody that's not familiar, gaslighting is a way of making somebody doubt their sense of self and their sense of reality. And um, it comes from the 1930s film Gaslight, where um, this man was abusive to his wife. He wanted her, she was very rich and he wanted her to get locked up in an asylum. So he used to turn the gas lights down. And then when she said, have you, done, have you turned them down? And he would say, no, no, I haven't. You, you're crazy. You don't know what you're talking about. You must be going mad. So that sort of narrative where you're making somebody question their own sense of reality. And for some of them, they didn't really know that that was the word for it. But then when I described what it was, it was like, oh, yeah, that happened a lot. Um, and also the way that that linked in with that isolation and that control then as well. Because actually, when you become isolated and you lose your social support and that social network, the power of this sort of abuse and control is, is so significant because there's no other voice to kind of counteract that within that. So another aspect of this, still this same data set um, that I've been doing with a colleague at Teesside University is to explore specifically the experiences of older men. So older men, when we look at sort of the narrative on domestic violence, we focus a lot obviously on women as victims, but we focus on younger people a lot as well. So actually what we have just sort of been doing is we've taken out a sample of this, of men that are over 60, and we've looked at their experiences um, specifically. So where you do see declines in violent behaviour um, as people get older, the men within this sample were still describing really serious physical violence and sexual violence, despite the fact that they were older. There was also control exerted again around the use of children, so that children was still a massive theme there in terms of how they could be manipulated. So we saw that this, this sort of, all of the themes that we've seen in the other data, it was still there even though they were older but that there were then very specific older experiences as well. So for the top um, guy there, he was in his 70s, I think, um, and she was trying to convince him that he had Alzheimer's so that he would sign power of attorney over to her and, and she would have even more power and control over him. For others, it was around the longevity of it almost, so the fact that the abuse had been continuing for such an extended period of time that it was almost part of their life and, and how they managed that was really difficult. Um, and for another one, this is an American participant that was massively around this idea of alimony and being able to collect money and stuff after um, they've divorced. 
So again, this was really significant impact of this abuse on these men. But these are older men. One man was in his 80s talking about this experience. So in ter I suppose in terms of thinking actually about the invisibility of men sometimes within this narrative, older men are even more invisible when we look at it. So when we come to look at the impact then of this, so we can see there hopefully that there are really significant experiences of physical, verbal, psychological, sexual violence there. We still come back to this idea that some people don't think it impacts on men the same. We come very much to this idea that actually all men are big and strong and so they can take it, or women are small and weak so can't really do that much damage with it. But actually, there are really significant impacts in terms of physical and mental health on men um, within the research. So again, Denise Hines and her colleagues um, in America, they have found that men experience similar mental health outcomes when we compare it to women, although that is an issue in itself where we compare, that I'll mention in a minute, um, but also that they meet the criteria for PTSD cut off in a clinical sense at similar rates to women that have experienced abuse as well. So it is really impacting the issue that you have within the literature is that we have a tendency when we look at the impact of violence to focus on internalised symptoms. So we have a focus of looking on actually things like anxiety and depression. Now women internalise their psychological distress much more than men do. Men tend to externalise it. I'm talking in a very slightly stereotypical generalised sense. But men will tend to externalise it. So where women would report higher rates of anxiety and depression, men would potentially be more involved within um, alcohol dependency or substance misuse because they're externalising that psychological distress. And so what we tend to do within the literature is focus on internalised symptoms and then compare men and women and say that women have it worse. I really don't agree with comparing men and women in this sense anyway because it doesn't really matter if some, one sex has it slightly worse than that in that sense or one gender is reporting slightly higher something. This is still a group of people that need help and support with the trauma that they're experiencing. So that is kind of part of the issues that have, they've been within the research. And so within my research here, this was sort of um, stuff that was coming out here. So they were talking about really significant impact on them both in terms of the physical sense, but also in terms of the psychological sense as well, so that actually their physical and mental health was really damaged by it. So for the first man, he had tried to... This is one of the most powerful things that I'd read in the whole day, but he tried to take his own life, and it hadn't worked, and when he woke up, she was there, and it was like the worst moment of his entire life because he tried to escape. He thought he'd escaped, but he was still in hell, and that's how he described it. Many of the men talked about the fact they were still afraid, Lots of the men talked about the fact they weren't on Facebook or they weren't on the electoral register or anything like that because they were so frightened of being found. And for others, it was just really about actually the impact in terms of the post-separation behaviour, and um, specifically around the children, which was massive, but also in terms of the fact it really affected them wanting to actually be in an intimate relationship with anybody else because actually putting that trust in somebody, sharing that part of you, it had been so... They'd felt so betrayed by what they'd experienced that they just didn't want to do that again. So one of the things that we don't really understand a huge amount in terms of men's experiences is about their post-separation abuse experiences in terms of their victimisation. What we understand about post-separation abuse, we understand from the women's literature. For example, literature that has looked at women's experiences of post-separation has demonstrated that that period of time immediately after separation is really dangerous. That is at the time that it's most likely that the um, ex-partner will kill them. So it's a real like, escalation of abuse and threat within that time. So we know that from the women's literature. When you look at the stalking literature, you see that actually the most common type of stalker is an ex-partner. And we see that men and women report experiences of that. So we do know that actually men can have these post-separation experiences. There's been a bit of research that has looked around custody disputes and divorce in terms of the impact that that has. So again, we know a little bit from women's perspective there about how damaging this time can be and how um, impactful it can be when that abuse continues. We know a little bit, as we sort of talked about already today, around parental alienation. So parental alienation is where that you know, one parent becomes alienated from their child. Um, and that can either be through purposeful means, as in they have abandoned them, so a, a parent can become alienated through their own behaviour, 
But actually, in this context, it's where the other parent is manipulating that relationship or withholding contact with that relationship. Now, I've put the little syndrome bit in brackets because um, there's debate within the literature. There's not a lot of consistency within the literature, but there's the talk of this idea of parental, parental alienation syndrome. So that is where the child becomes so in meshed, I suppose, almost within this abusive behaviour that they start to actually be abusive towards the target parent as well. Now, I'm a little uncomfortable with the syndrome element of it. I totally acknowledge that actually sometimes these children do become part of it and, and you know, it's horrendous, the sorts of things that can occur at this point. Um, but I don't really like the syndrome element because I'm less comfortable with labelling children, I suppose, in that way. But I think that's probably a separate conversation. Um, but Ben Hine and I, um, who's at the back there, sorry, as I point to you, um, from the University of West London, we're looking a bit more into parental alienation at the moment using some similar methodology to the previous work that I've done. So I'm hoping that we can understand a little bit more about it um, later. So for this study then, what I did was I took um, all of this and I thought, well, actually, we don't know anything then about men's post-separation experiences. We don't know anything about how that abuse continues or changes after the end of the relationship. So I did um, 13 interviews with men and they talked about different behaviour that had occurred. So for one, the physical element of it, so that physical violence tended to have ended because the proximity and the availability of being able to engage in that behaviour was less. But the psychological kind of controlling behaviour and harassment was really persistent within their accounts. So men talking about being harassed over a number of years through emails, through phone calls, through, you know, that persistent contact. But also that sort of manipulation and harassment in the psychological and emotional sense around the children. So that top quote there on Father's Day where he purposely tried to go and do something different because he knew he wasn't going to see his children. He tried to go away and distract himself from already being upset and she'd text him, Happy Father's Day, you effing sperm donor. So to, to, to that continue to try and have that influence on somebody when you're not, even, you're not living together anymore, obviously, but you're persistently trying to kind of impact them in that way. There was also, where in the data where people were talking about their relationship, there was also the threat of false allegations. But within this post-separation data, there was actual false allegations that were made. So false allegations of things like domestic violence, of child abuse, of rape. And these had really serious implications for men who had been arrested and, and it had been investigated, but also where it had affected their job because they were suspended and things, because obviously when you start talking about these things, that's going to happen. So this was persistent within the narratives of these men in this study, this either threat of or actual making of false allegations. And it was continuing and it was often escalating. So again, that escalation that you see in the women's literature that's really focused on physical violence, but here that kind of attempt to harass and control and still maintain some sort of influence on that man's life was really persistent, either through it just getting worse in terms of that, in, in that harassing way, um, or actually for some they talked about how it was bad before, but then after it got, it got even worse and it changed into something different. So it massively revolved again for the fathers around their children and children were used as a weapon both in terms of withholding contact or manipulating that relationship so for some men they weren't allowed to see their children through a process of this the woman had made false allegations manipulated courts you know so they were their contact wasn't allowed or even when it was allowed that relationship was still being manipulated for this second man here um, she had told their child that he'd killed her cat and that he wanted to kill her and her sister and her mum and bury them in the garden. So then this poor child didn't want to see her dad because she was terrified. So that influence that the woman had had in this circumstance was massive and that massively then obviously is going to impact on that relationship. <coughs> but children were being manipulated as part of the abuse as well. So in attempt to send him messages backwards and forwards and things like that, or the child um, talking about, or this man was reporting that the child had said that every time it, they were going to meet and have the handover, she would get upset and say, I don't know what I'm going to do when you're not here. And that child is then carrying that sort of, that guilt and experience of not knowing what to do with their parents. <coughs> 
Um, and for another one where he, the daughters had tried to talk to him about the fact that their mum tells lies and they don't know what to do and how he had to try and manage that in a way that wasn't then abusive in some way. So him trying to kind of navigate so that the relationship is there for, for that child with both of their parents. Because what you do see within some of the literature on parental alienation is that when children engage in behaviour, it's often to try and make sure they can keep a relationship with one parent so the fear of losing that one parent they have a strong bond with it must be terrifying for a small child. So we kind of just move into this idea of the barriers that there are then around help seeking. So within both of these studies, a lot of the men had never really told anybody. They certainly hadn't reported it to the police or when they had, they hadn't unfortunately had strong um, or good experiences with it. But one of the barriers to um, leaving that they talked about was around this kind of idea that actually, as, ma as a man within this system, the fear of being accused of being a perpetrator, the fear of all the sort of things that come with being treated differently as a man within the criminal justice system, specifically around domestic violence, was a really big thing. So it led for uh, me and my colleague Julie Taylor at the University of Cumbria, that, um, where I work, we did some work then looking at actually the barriers that existed to help seeking. So again, what we see within the literature is stuff that's explored women's experiences of help, um, help seeking and the barriers that they face. Because actually help seeking and reporting experiences when you're a victim of domestic violence, regardless of your gender or sexuality, is a really, really massive thing. There are loads of barriers that people face. But what we wanted to explore really was where these barriers were for men. So this is a very colourful chart, sorry. Um, what we saw then was that these barriers fell into sort of three major themes, really. They were on a personal, a social and a structural level. So on a personal level, there were issues around how being a victim doesn't fit with that, um, nor those social, social norms and gender roles around things like masculinity. Masculinity emphasises being strong, being um, stoic, being able to look after yourself, being able to look after your family. And actually, when we look at what being a victim means, that doesn't fit with that gender role. And so that can be a massive um, issue for men in terms of their own barriers in being able to talk about what they're experiencing. So this is where we see people talk about shame and embarrassment and not wanting to talk about it. But again, for people where it were, they were fathers, there was also a huge thing around the family and the children, not just in terms of them not wanting to lose contact, although that was actually obviously a huge thing, but also in terms of they're trying to keep their family together. So we talked a bit, obviously, today about men being protectors and this sort of thing, but actually men were trying to keep their families together. They didn't want to lose their family. For some of them, they didn't want the abuse to... They wanted the abuse to stop. They didn't necessarily want their family to break down. They just wanted the violence to stop. So that was on a personal level that these barriers were. But then on a social level we saw false allegations. The threat of false allegations in particular was a really significant barrier for men. For their female partner to be saying, if you do that, I'm going to tell them that you raped me, or I'm going to tell them that you, you hit me, or I'm going to tell them that you hit our children. That was a huge barrier in stopping them doing anything and telling anybody. And again, the responses then of their friends and their networks and society in that sense, it played into this stigma that then men experience where they think, actually, I can't talk about this. I'm the only person that this is happening to. Um, people will think that I'm an abuser because that's what it looks like when we talk about domestic violence. So all of these things came in to be like another layer of barriers there. But also on a structural level, when we actually look at the provision that is available, what domestic violence still looks like in society is that it's a women's issue, that men are perpetrators, and it's still too dominant a stereotype for men to be able to challenge that, really, at this stage. We talk about victims as women, the big pictures and the cowering man, you know, over this... No, sorry, the cowering woman with a man sort of standing over with his, you know, shaking his fist or whatever... Those are still images that people associate with domestic violence and that men don't fit within that image and they don't feel they fit within that image either. So they felt that actually services, even when they are available, don't appear available, but also that men have either the fear of or the experience of being treated as a criminal rather than a father or as a, as a victim. They're being treated as the perpetrator. So this came in massively throughout. 
And then this was just a few quotes that um, fit within these sort of three barriers. So you can see here again, we talk, um, they talked about shame and feeling embarrassed and all the things that we described here, talking about their masculinity and their manhood and that being questioned with the experiences that they had. A lot of men, even just within these two quotes here, but throughout the whole data set, a lot of men would refer to their size, but I'm six foot this, I'm this, and she's this, as if that actually invalidates their experience in some way in their, in their eyes. So they talked a lot about this idea that actually people wouldn't believe them or people would, like they were embarrassed because she was this and he was this. So that was a huge thing as well. And again, as I say, on a structural level where men are just frightened of or have the experience of not being treated as a victim but being treated as a perpetrator because they are a man within this sort of setting and within this criminal justice system. So this was again a really significant issue for them. So on these three levels of barriers, what you also see is other things that feed into that. So fear is a huge one. We don't, again, still sort of, we talk a lot about women and women's fear as victims, but we still don't talk a lot about men being scared. Men get scared. Oh my God, five minutes, crikey. Okay, I'll speed up a little bit here. Um, so the fear of the reprisal, the fear of being arrested, the fear of being falsely accused is a massive thing that stops them talking about it. But also being isolated. So all of that stuff that I said earlier about the fact they become isolated from their strong social networks, it means they don't have people to talk to or to confide in. They're frightened of what will happen. Um, and the, again, the children was just such a strong theme for anybody that was a father within the sample. The children was the strongest theme. So I'm just going to talk to you very, very briefly then um, about the fourth study, which was really trying to look at actually what happens after then in terms of them as men. So what happens to them in terms of how they recover or how they move on from this experience? So what I did was a study um, using something called photo elicitation. So photo elicitation is used in a visual, something visual in an interview setting. And for this, what we did was we asked men to bring their photos that represented their experience after the end of the relationship. So rather than me, not only uh, I'm not a victim of domestic violence, but obviously I'm not a man either, asking questions about what I think is important, I sort of let them bring the questions and we talk through the photos and, and the data sort of comes out that way. So the themes that existed within the photos, but obviously within the narrative, was massively around the ongoing impact of their experience. So men were talking about the fact that they were, um, for this man he was on antidepressants, um, another man was talking about that he had lost tons of weight because he just was so, he was so upset and stressed and, and, and traumatised by everything he wasn't eating. Um, for another man on the end, he was talking about this just idea of kind of going around in circles and that, like getting up and going to work and then coming home and he wasn't, he just felt so down and isolated and depressed by the whole thing. So the ongoing impact of it was really strong. So men had often been separated from the abusive partners for several years, but the impact of it was still massive to them. And again, for those that were fathers, the thing that was the most impactful was the relationship with their children and how that had been manipulated. So for most of the men within the sample, they were fathers, and all of them talked about that relationship being manipulated in some way. And that the photos that they brought really strongly... That, that idea of being a father and, and how that is part of their identity was a huge part of their experience and the impact that this had. So for the two men on the left, the one in the middle, he hadn't seen his, his children sorry, for years, so he was just focusing on actually that he is a good dad and that when he gets contact with those children again, he's going to remember and just be really you know, clear that he is a good dad and thinking about all the ways he's a good dad and he was working through that you know, in a help-seeking way as well. And then that photo on the end really represented actually the ongoing trauma that can exist in handover. So the handover and that kind of exchange of children in that moment is just another opportunity for that abusive ex-partner to continue trying to be abusive. So that was a huge thing. And the, really, the most upsetting part of it was just the emptiness that some men still felt, the struggle that they were still experiencing in trying to move on from what had happened to them. So again, for some men, it had been years since this relationship had ended, but it was still really impacting on them. So for the man who um, brought the photo on the left, he was talking about the fact that this, this um, statue, I can't remember where he said it was now, but he'd seen it and it just represented how he felt, that emptiness and that there was a big chunk of him missing. 
and he hadn't seen his children for, I think, set, I think it was like four or five years at that point. So there was just this part of him that was missing, and he felt so empty and alone all the time. Um, and again, for other men, it was it's the same thing. They're just the, that feeling of distress and that emptiness and that loneliness and that depression that's associated. It was a really strong theme within it. So I want to just rant very briefly um, about where all of this comes together and can create issues. So for men who are experiencing something like this, they're experiencing a trauma and they're experiencing something that they are struggling to talk about and ask for help for. So anything, any service that is working with them needs to approach and work with them in a non-judgmental way. And so actually when you have models of help seeking um, that have an assessment and a screening procedure, that is adding an additional layer of victimisation for men. So for some models of help seeking, for some models that organisations work in, um, there is a screening process which is basically, or an assessment process, which is basically checking that the man that's ringing up as a victim isn't a perpetrator in disguise. So that's wrong for an, a number of reasons. Um, you're assuming that men are perpetrators. Um, you are adding an additional layer of victimisation to a group of men who are already really vulnerable. Um, if a man knows that this is the case, then that is obviously going to affect him coming forward and be another barrier to him actually being able to ask for help. But also the same process isn't in place for women, despite the fact we know bidirectional abuse is a really serious issue. So for me, you screen everyone or you screen no one. And to, obviously to me, you screen nobody. Anybody that is ringing up and asking for help should be believed and should be treated in that way straight away. So to me, this model is massively, massively impactful. And what it does is it creates this secondary victimisation whereby you are placing somebody who is vulnerable and needing help with more barriers to actually being able to get that and treating them differently, ultimately here, because they're men. And it's assuming men are perpetrators, it's assuming men are always trying to manipulate a system, when actually the evidence suggests women are doing that more, but we're still treating men unequally in this way. And the last thing that I'll say um, is just a little bit about the current legislation that there is and how that's impacting. So the domestic abuse bill and the gender definition that's been pushed for around domestic violence is huge as an issue for men. When you gender a definition, you're saying it's gender-based violence. Gender-based violence means that's violence occurring towards women because they're women. And that ignores a whole host of men's experiences. It has a whole host of issues when we look at the LGBTQ plus population as well. And it really impacts, again, on men thinking, well, I can't be a victim of domestic violence, can I? Because that's saying it's a, it's a gendered issue, so as a man, that can't impact on me. So again, another barrier, a structural barrier that is put in place. And additionally, the coercive control legislation at the moment doesn't protect men from their post-separation abuse. When you are looking at coercive control within a relationship where you are a current partner, an ex-partner but still living together, or a relative then what that means is that you are protected under that coercive control law. But if you are an ex-partner but not living together, then they suggest that actually stalking and harassment legislation is more appropriate. But actually the stalking and harassment legislation, whilst it does cover things like the harassment and the constant contacting and things, it doesn't cover things like false allegations or parental alienation or that manipulation that can still occur around the children. And actually what it says within the legis legislation sorry, is where there is an ongoing relationship, then the offence of coercive or controlling behaviour should be considered. So the first one. But if you separate from a partner and your relationship in an intimate sense isn't there anymore, but you have children together, then you are always going to have a relationship. If you have a child, there will always be an ongoing relationship for the rest of your lives. So actually, as we have it at the moment, it isn't protecting men from what happens to them post-separation um, and I think that that's a really serious issue as well um, I'll stop talking now, thank you <laughs> That was a great talk, thanks you talked about punish you. at the start punishment for going against social norms Yes is that something you've experienced with 10 years of your research? <laughs> uh, that's a good question. Um, I think that there are lots of Christmas card lists I'm not on anymore. 
um, to put it one way. There are lots of people that I know don't like the work that I do. Um, so yes, I suppose in a nutshell, I have, ex I have experienced backlash for the work that I do, yeah, massively. Apart from Mekun, the, uh, fra the phrase, unbelievable presentation you have given. Thank you. Can I say that from my uh, cold face experience over the last 11 years, uh, I'm chair of Central London and North London branches, Families Need Fathers, the only remote chance there is of children having better welfare in the future is from professional women like yourself taking apart the status quo. I have long ago given up on most men in society ever doing anything about it because they're so coerced, so beaten by the system, they won't challenge it because of budget restraints, cuts and social intimidation. Pioneers like you are beyond priceless. I only thank you. Thank you. Can I just respond briefly to you that, actually? Sorry. Uh, thank you. That is very kind of you to say. Um, but just at lunchtime, we were talking about the fact that, actually, it's easier for me to talk about this because I'm a woman, I think. It shouldn't be the case, but it, it definitely is. But thank you. Sorry. Yeah, you just uh, brought up a bit about the parental alienation um, and the, the legislations that don't cover this sort of thing and the other things. Are you being able to get any influences or talk to people to <laughs> encourage this? Because you're absolutely right. And other countries have laws against like parental alienation, but we haven't, we're not progressing there. Um, I'm trying. <laughs> I'm trying. Um, I, I was part of the consultation, like I got involved with the Domestic Abuse Bill consultation. I responded to um, each stage where you were offered to submit written evidence. I submitted it all the time, every single time. I came back to the fact that parental alienation should be within the domestic abuse definition, absolutely. So I am trying, but it's quite hard. <laughs> Thanks again. Thank you. Fun.